Computational museology, the title of this talk, is a term that allows us to link all forms of curatorial material, cultural materiality, objects, knowledge systems, representation and participation, underscored by the positional shifts occurring in digital archives from object orientations to computing with multiple dimensions, segmentation, analytics and visualization, computational museology harnesses the potential for computational practices within the museum domain. And this talk explores what unites machine intelligence with data curation, ontology with visualization, and communities of publics and practitioners with embodied participation through immersive interfaces. Our era, it is said, has created a paradigm of users who transform the physical assets of cultural organizations into digital assets to be uploaded, downloaded, visualized, shared. Users who treat institutions not as storehouses of physical objects, but rather as data sets to be manipulated. And in counterpoint, this presentation explores the ways in which these mechanistic descriptions of database logic can be transformed and computation can become experiential, spatial and materialized, embedded and embodied in the everyday workings of museums and the wider realms of archives and libraries. It was at the birth of the information age in the 1950s that the prominent designer Georgi Kapish, MIT, said information abundance should be a landscape of the senses that organizes both perception and practice. This felt order, he said, should be a source of beauty, data transformed from its measured quantities and recreated as sensed forms, exhibiting the properties of harmony, rhythm, and proportion. So for the last 20 years or so, I've been designing large-scale interactive frameworks for public engagement with cultural heritage, initially at Museum Victoria, where I started to build these large-scale experiences uh, for mass public. I then started to work with universities to help sustain this kind of research and its infrastructure um, for the glam sector. I co-established the Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment at, uh, in Hong Kong, and then returned to Australia to build the Expanded Perception and Interaction Center at the University of New South Wales. And here, on the right-hand side of the screen, just so you know what you're looking at, it's a small seven-meter diameter visualization and environment. It's comprised of 56 projectors and a 29 the cluster, it's 120 million pixels in 3D. At the edge of human visual acuity, it was designed to solve visualization problems for complexity and big data in the humanities and the sciences. And now at EPFL in Switzerland, a 1500 square meter laboratory with 12 large scale systems that offer us strategies for multi-sensory engagement, emphasizing human-to-human -human, as well as human-to-machine interaction, giving us powerful ways to reformulate narrative in a digital context. And in participation with diverse communities, the laboratory uh, blends experimental curatorship and contemporary aesthetics with open science, digital humanism, and emerging technologies. We harness uh, technologies that have unprecedented abilities to capture the world around us. Laser scanning, for example, collects billions of points to represent places, such as these heads at Mount Rushmore, scanned by the Scottish 10. We can create precious objects in 3D and peer inside to see what was previously unseen. We can also capture art in a way that allows us to zoom into the tiniest brushstroke and reveal more than the naked eye can see. Advances in machine learning are also an emerging trend in our work. We recently installed the photogrammetric model of Nefertari's tomb, which was collected in only eight hours of photography by a single cameraman and used to create a model for, 
4,000 images creates a model of billions of points. This is then transferred to our 360 3D system at 40 million pixels. It was the world's first demonstrator of um, Unreal Engine's endlessly synchronization technology. We also recently acquired the Cold Lab 3D robotic photogrammetry arm, which is used for high fidelity, color accurate photogrammetry in a kind of pipeline. And one of the other areas that I work in a lot is to do with intangible cultural heritage and various forms of motion capture and motion over time analytics. The key themes that I want to explore with you today are both theoretical and applied interfaces to inhabiting cultural imaginaries, computational archives and their emergent narratives, deep mapping and cardio criticism, embodied knowledge systems and the ontologies of motion, deep face, which is an exhibition which converges many of the themes that I'll bring up today, and if we have time, which it sounds like we do. I'll move on to the voice of the visitor. Immersive experiences are synonymous with the sensorial attributes, not only of vision, but also a range of acoustic, kinesthetic, and somatic characteristics. Immersion is also emotional, emerging from the dynamics of affecting and being affected, and is characterized by a dense involvement of the subject in an interactive and inter-affective context that entangles thinking, feeling, and acting. Post-processual archaeologist Christopher Tilley says kinesthetic approaches to landscape stress role with the carnal human body. The way we perceive and relate to visual imagery is fundamentally related to the kinds of bodies we have. Christopher Penny describes corporeal and body aesthetics, the way in which Iconic images transfix their viewers. The performative and aesthetic qualities of human computer interaction are rooted in the user's experience of herself performing her perception, suggesting that the user is simultaneously the operator, the performer, the observer, and the spectator. Embodiment theory, informing presence theory, is central to these processes in post digital encounters. The dome of the Prince of Wales Museum was adopted as the epicenter of an artistic exploration that specifically focuses the ceiling architectures of Mumbai's heritage and contemporary buildings and transforms them into an urban celestial imaginary. Mumbai's architectural heritage is unrivaled in India. It has one of the largest representations of grand neo-Gothic style architecture. Numerous examples of indo saracenic architecture and one of the world's largest numbers of Art Deco buildings for any city. We shot 160 gigapixel images throughout the city. Um, this was the Baljulad Museum. This is turned on to the new Mumbai Airport. And we took the six meter dome from my lab and put it under the 60 foot ceiling of the Prince of Wales Museum and it allowed about 2,000 people a day to rediscover their city with fresh eyes. Open to all, it gave new perspectives on many of the spaces that are socially exclusive despite their public heritage status. And the work uses a simple computer vision algorithm that randomly selects any pair of images and creates a unique transition between them. So in effect, you can lie there all day and never see the same thing twice. And the concept of an experiential domed environment emerged from attempts to simulate the spherical gestalt of the human visual field and was designed to exploit and extend sensory perception. In collaboration with the National Museum of Australia, we created two dome experiences, Kraven and Kankana Galpa, the song line of the Seven Sisters. This song line portrays one of the most defining and predominant major narratives chronicled in ancient mainland Australia, and it had never been told in the public domain until this exhibition. And the project was seven years in the making from the day that the Anangu elders came to the museum to ask, uh, to ask for their help to keep this song line alive. The first work involved photogrammetry of a sacred cave which had never been photographed before, which you can see on the far right. Time lapse 
photography, drone-based panoramas, and gigapixel imaging, as well as animatronics, allow visitors intimate views of the sand stories contained within these sandstone folds. And I'm sorry about the ambient light, because it's almost white on the screen. Anyway, the uh, digital dome was used and chosen by the Anuku elders for this project to simultaneously express the sphere of the world around us, not only the sky above, but also the ground below. Archaic dome and theatres are typified by the rock art caves found throughout Australia, and as the theorist Nick Lambert argues, these ancient caves where etchings and paintings were animated by fire and torchlight represent some of the beginnings of the cinematic imaginary, arguably the first immersive experiences created by humankind. The second uh, dome uh, story immerses visitors in the projected artworks of the song line made by its custodians, the Matu um, tribe, and uh, they depict the seven sisters as they travel country and here they've made these wonderful tr uh, trust grass figures, they're called Jami figures, and they're being sung off the land um, by uh, the Matu elders um, because they were collected by the National Museum. It's a slightly bleak looking picture here. They go from this vibrant world to the world of collecting. Um, but we were able to make photogrammetric models and then worked with the artists who created specific depictions of each part of this narrative in a whole series of fisheye paintings, some displaying, displaying almost perfect um, fisheye distortion for freedom of projection. This led to a complex set of interpretations that led the narrative, um, and these were then subsequently animated. And this is a shot from the opening of the exhibition and won all the major awards um, in that year for large-scale exhibitions in Australia. But what was most important was the lengthy and complex seven-year negotiation which resulted in a watershed of curatorial and indigenous relations in Australia. What was also pivotal was that there was research infrastructure grant funding that enabled me to build a museum, uh, build a full dome for five different museums. Um, once the exhibition was successful, the National Museum was empowered to invest in their own full dome system um, and to then subsequently tour all over the world. So this project is currently uh, touring. It was in the UK, it's currently in Berlin, and it will be on its way to Paris and then the Key Bradley Museum um, very soon. So we're journeying now to the Dunhuang Caves in the Gobi Desert of northern West China. At the nexus of the Silk Road, this World Heritage Site has 492 caves carved into this cliff face. Inside are 45,000 square meters of painted frescoes and over 2,500 stucco statues. Crafted by Buddhist monks over a period of a thousand years, this sublime art treasure is like nothing else in the Chinese Buddhist world. Most are permanently closed to the public to ensure their preservation and the digital is the only mode of visitation in an era characterized by heritage at risk. These caves are under serious threat from increasing tourism, microclimate change, rising humidity makes the paint flake off the walls, and there's an enormous preservation effort underway there. There are between 60 and 90 full-time photographers, and it takes three months to digitize a single cave. And the Pure Land projects were designed to activate the kinesthetic spatial responses of their viewers, and they give us some important insights into how interfaces operate in the museological domain. Pure Land AR was originally conceived for our Basel in Hong Kong, and we print the wireframe from the laser scan on the walls of an exhibition booth, and then the visitor is walking around inside the digital model using this tablet like a window on the world. It has three noteworthy qualities, the way that it harnesses socialization around a single screen. It's not about giving everybody their own device in museums, it's actually a 
about how you harness the social dynamics which are at the core of the museological experience. These interfaces need to be available for young kids, middle-aged ladies, grandmother and grandchild. Grandmother abandons the grandchild. So non-aging systems are also very important. The third most noteworthy quality is that of virtual, virtual tourism. Here is a wife, she takes an iPad from her handbag and she films her husband's experience as if they were really there. It was reformed as an interactive experience for a full dome, it's a pyramidal cave for the World Economic Forum, and here again in 360 3D. And indeed, a single data set was used to create five completely different exhibition installations and they've now been seen by over a million people worldwide. And it's this malleability of digital data that is its intrinsic quality. Inside and Out is a work um, which entices the viewer into new um, multi-sensory engagement. So placing the head-mounted display on your head, um, you're in a rotating um, chair, and this interactive device is a tongue switch, which is um, used for photographers when they're hanging off a cliff and they need to take the photograph. Um, so you pop a miniature condom onto the tongue switch and you pop that in your mouth. And then you use your tongue to navigate inside the visual imagery. Um, and here the visitors are running their tongues over these ruinous scenes. Um, this is uh, Angkor in Cambodia. It's stereographic, they're both stereographic. And this is a bombed out paint factory on the edges of Sydney. And so here, the tongue itself becomes a visceral point of touch that can only imagine what kind of nasty, sharp things one is about to lick up against. Interfaces also embrace the spatial formats of their originating media. The Amaki Navigator enables visitors the spatial temporal form of navigation through, the pain, through a painterly narrative. These are the three hand scrolls for the poetry contest of the 12 uh, zodiac animals. And from a physically embodied point of view, viewers reveal each of these 17th century hand scrolls along their entire length of one to one scale. And they're about 12 meters long each, between 11 and 12 meters long each. So, uh, horizontal navigation the system responds to the viewer's interests and the dynamic touch screen travels along these rails um, traversing the full length of each hand scroll. And the scrolls are unfolded in the original reading direction from right to left while visitors can also jump to points of view and between individual scrolls. The ultra high resolution imaging was completed by the custodians at the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin um, enabling zooming into tiny details too small for the naked eye to see, providing an unparalleled intimacy in the materiality of each, their pigments and papers, the subtle colors of gold and silver, and their audio compositions, which you probably can hear, are dynamic and they emerge from the visitors' interactions, adding a narrative drama um, in, as the animals engage in a poetry competition or indeed embark into battle. So it's a kind of aesthetic experience that not only emulates traditional hand scrolls but also transforms visitor involvement in interactive and non linear narrative enabling interface. And as simple as this is, um, it requires a fundamental shift between linear and non linear spatial folds intrinsic to the digital form. We are also busy creating large scale digital twins. This is a project that I've just begun. Uh, and this painting is a section of the Swiss Battle of Confederation by the German artist Louis Braun, painted in 1893. And it's a classic 19th century panorama. It, 
is 100 meters long by 10 meters high. So last time it was displayed was 2002, Jean Nouvel, the French architect, built a box for it and they floated it in the lake after they'd done eight years of conservation on it. Um, and that was the last time it was ever seen. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we rescued it from military storage. There are three rolls like this where it's been languishing for the last 20 years and uh, we're about to image it uh, with 150 megapixel camera, so 400,000 images. It will create the largest single image ever at 1.6 trillion pixels. Um, and then there will be um, yet to be a series of museum installations at various museums retelling what is quite a nationalistic and controversial military history um, through costume modeling, animation, dynamic sound, etc. So even before database logic pervaded our thinking, the museum was marked by profound shifts in our understanding of the archive. In modernity, the archive was described as a product of bureaucracy designed to be used as an instrument of power management. Foucault set this out in the archaeology of knowledge in the late 60s. In archive fever, Jacques Derrida in 1996 described mechanization and digitization of archival materials which created instant access to databases, employing efficient dendritic classification and retrieval, and this is where most archives sit today. Um, but new archival access modalities are seeking the properties of recollection, regeneration, reworking, or remediation, as it's often called. They're dynamic, and they correspond to this move from classification to remix and offer paradigmatic shifts from orthodox models of stewardship to one of co-production. And what we need now are new prosthetic architectures for the public engagement with these archives of cultural memory. Here's a few experiments in that domain. So as we know, at most museums, there's only a fraction of the collection on display. The majority of treasures are hidden from view at the Smithsonian. It's only 2% on display. British Museum, 0.4%. Museum Victoria, 0.85% uh, on display, 16 million objects. So we built the museum a national data browser. Um, it's 100,000 objects. It can be interactively accessed, examined at once and on scale. Um, what's interesting about it is that it took 15 minutes to get the data which supports this work, the 100,000 objects, 25 fields of data we use. They are temporarily distributed across 18 themes and it brings together indigenous materials with social and uh, social history and natural sciences, three domains which are typically not brought together. You can zoom into the images, it creates a work from the description, the curators love it because you can access the original record. There is no text-based search engine, so it's a serendipitous browsing machine, um, a real-time curating machine. And what's most important is the metadata linkages that take us between these very diverse thematic um, topics. It has emergent sound that comes from the uh, collections of the museum. So as a real-time curating machine, you will always be presented with the unexpected. We also know that audiovisual archives and sound archives are the major records of the 20th and 21st century. And the sheer size and temporal nature of audiovisual material presents its custodians with significant challenges related to access and meaningful engagement with these vast archives is primary concern for these custodians. And this demonstrator, T Visionary of 2008 at Ice Cinema, uses 24 hours of free to air broadcast TV footage um, from five Australian channels, takes it offline, analyzes by software. Every time there's a camera angle change, there's a cut made in the movie, and there's a database of 24,000 clips of approximately four seconds each. 
four guides were hired to sit in a dark room and then hand tag each one of these four second clips with largely quite subjective idiosyncratic metadata. You couldn't use uh, computer vision and machine learning to do most of this anyway yet. Emotion, expression, physicality, speed, scene structure, these are all um, the, some of the tags, as well as more obvious ones such as gender and color and so on. So we stream 500 simultaneous streams of video um, to the 360 system, and then the user of this system uh, can operate on this database. So yes, a tag of the on any image, it brings everything that's semantically most similar to one side and everything that's most dissimilar is behind me. So, for purposes of demonstration, you bring up you can when you're searching, and uh, you will in fact choose color at this point um, because it's easy to demonstrate. Click on the fire and red stuff and it brings all the fire and red stuff to one side and all the black and whites, the titles, the credits, all of the intros to all of the movies appear behind you. So it's the concept of aesthetic transcription or pan aesthetics and how new ways in which meaning can be produced as content moves from one expressive medium to another in a trans narrative. And here you're able to add clips together, so you're recombining the narratives of different movies. The combinatory narrative is one of the terms that are being used uh, to describe this. So it's reconceptualizing this spatial montage, and it uh, has many analogies. Talk about Canini's picture galleries or Barbie Warburg's Nemesis and Atlas, um, and it's the way that uh, these images move within this space that give people um, this analytic approach. The jazz luminaries was based on more recent work on the jazz uh, constellation of the jazz greats between uh, of EPFL's seminal. UNESCO Memory of the World Digitization um, Project or the Archive. Um, the installation cuts, remixes, and replays 5,400 artists and 13,000 videos from a total archive of 11,000 hours. And the neural net like image that you see here is based on the social network of the artists, and the clustering is based on the numbers of times one artist played with another artist. So at the very center of this dense network is B.B. King. Visitors lie under the dome and they use a spherical interface to navigate inside the constellation, emulating the hemisphere in which the folder is staged, the, or the application is staged. And the paradigm that is being used is like tuning a radio, it's searching by listening, circumventing the lack of public knowledge into who actually the great jazz performers are. And hearing what you like drives the design to unfold in three days, a sample of all songs, full song. to get in. 
inside um, this these vast corpus, inside a film, inside segments of a film, inside the image, inter-image and intra-image, leading to a kind of operationalization of the archive that sits way beyond its metadata. Um, and then narrative visualization, how we can bring uh, new narratives together through um, spatial, temporal, social, effective and aesthetic qualities of these movies and then bring these into the public domain. So it's addressing the fact, once again, that most of these archives are massively copyright encrusted and they have nothing online to share. The theoretical uh, framework for the next section lies in deep mapping and cardo criticism. And we need to reconceive maps um, or interpretations of a map as moving, embodied, social, technical, and emotive, but as an opportunities to present alternative visual solutions to the specific problems of depicting and describing places and time. By conceiving of maps through a deep mapping schema, we posit that it never fully forms, they're not static, but emerge in navigational processes where everything is on the move. This is an early work, uh, Place Humpy, which is a meditation on creating a deep map. It was an artwork that was commissioned for France in India in 2006 and it subsequently toured all over the world. Humpy is a monumental world heritage site and vibrant center for contemporary pilgrimage. And the artwork recombines 25 square kilometers of this extraordinary terrain and a 3D panoramic imaginary. The panoramas were made using this rare stereoscopic film camera, it's an analog camera for those people that are interested in this stuff. Um, creating a left and right my image, which can be drawn scanned to any resolution. Um, and with these materials, we create these panoramic landscapes, um, which you can navigate. We use Amazonics for uh, 3D architecture of sound. And the somatic resonances in place humpy are informed by aspects of Indian cultural and religious life, in particular the history of chromolithography and the scopic regimes of magical realism. So this is a scene from the Ramayana of Kishkinda. Humpy is said to be Kishkinda. These strategies um, that we used here, uh, animated vignettes working together with, it was the first animation done in India, 3D animation done in India, um, by Indian artists and animators, and it's um, the idea is to bring together these idioms of chromolithography, theatre photography, and film um, in this work. Motion capture for animation, and it's staged in the place platform, which is a 360-degree screen, which has a motorized platform at its center. And the visitor is able to rotate their field of view in 360 degrees. So, passive stereo in this instance, and you're driving yourself through this panoramic landscape, a serendipitous journey of discovery across many of the wonderful places at Compi. If you speak into a microphone which is mounted on a platform that releases a Sanskrit text into the world, it comes from chapter 13 and 37, which is to do with the gathering of the monkeys at Kishkinda, and you enter inside some of these panoramas and you have these animated Hindu gods. The music is by Dr. El Subramanian, who's a chromatic violin um, superstar. So this I toured all over the world then and became part of a much bigger exhibition about the archaeological imaginary of this site. Um, and then it was bought by the Jindal Foundation and the whole museum complex was built for it um, for the exhibition right next to the World Heritage Site itself. So I won't go into too many details here, but um, perhaps this is, is relevant to the positioning of, of cultural heritage. These are slides from the launch of the museum. So the young boys from Humpy dressed up as Hanuman, 
Um, the Lakshmi is the local temple elephant. She came over for the opening. She was blessing all the politicians that emerged. So this is Lakshmi um, doing what she normally does, which is blessing the rooms as it's during the um, uh, tariff, uh, the director's tariff, it's up and down the bazaar of Hanky, as you can see here. But while we were building the museum, the Archaeological Survey of India was also undertaking systematic destruction of every temporary structure on the site, which created um, 5,000 refugees from this village, the infrastructure of this village, um, and in an effort by the um, ASI to turn it into a middle class um, you know, tourist resort um, as a major cooking spot, that's quite a tough task. But this was the bum shop uh, when we first started working there, and then uh, this is the bum shop at Pumpy today. So, this massive destruction of the the lifeblood, you could say, of the site itself. And this is um, a slide of a holy man cleaning up after uh, a puja at a Shiva Lina. And it really represents for me this profound care, the human care of the material world with which we surround ourselves with. And world heritage status and lots of these uh, statuses um, I really no protection, no protection from environmental human intervention on heritage sites. Um, and digital preservations create uh, for us reservoirs for interpretation and reinterpretation into the future in this context. The Atlas of Maritime Buddhism is based on a compelling story of the spread of Buddhism from India through the seaports of Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, supported by archaeological and historical evidence that have never been brought together before. And the spread of Buddhist doctrines from India to China triggered a profusion of cross-cultural exchanges that had profound impact on Asian and world history. Uh, but this archive also has profound contemporary uh, relevance to the socio-economic and political transformation of the world by the Chinese government-led initiative known as One Belt, One Road. And this atlas that we've been building counterbalances pervading narratives that neglect the importance of pan-Asian maritime countries and Buddhist entrepreneurship in the expansion of trade from the second century BC to the 14th century AD. Buddhism was spread by sailors who took with their votive talisman and also intrepid monks from China and present day Indonesia played really key roles in this exchange. Um, these included monks that were uh, in the 7th century traveling from China through um, the maritime routes and journeys that took up to 27 years through Sri Javaya in Indonesia, Kerala, and Malaysia, and then up into northern India to the great Buddhist universities. So our address starts the rock caves of India, and the aim was really to develop a nar pioneering narrative-driven deep mapping schema, a kind of information visualization framework for interactively examining the narrative patterns, processes, and phenomena in the atlas. So this is um, at Ajanta in India, the rock cut caves. Very, very simple field work equipment, just a very small team, seven countries, and then COVID came, thousands of locations um, were recorded in ultra high resolution 3D panoramic um, imaging and spherical pixels, as well as anisonics and the capture of a lot of contemporary Buddhist practices. Um, such as this is um, in Bihar, a Buddhist pilgrimage in Bihar. Photogrammetry also became a vital component of this data capture process, and we are looking at creating a spatial temple the browser of iconographic changes. Um, uh, Avalokiteshvara becomes grey in China. 
um, and processes like that. This is Jaiwan the Seventh uh, from Angkor in Cambodia, the National Museum. The Chuagadam Pagoda, probably the most uh, revered site in Burma, fusing both historical and mythological um, uh, legends. The far flung first to third century stupas in Sarnati with their incredibly elaborate sculptural panels depicting King Ashoka, who transformed India with the written word to the great universities of Buddhist scholarship in Nalanda and Bihar, which uh, flourished in the fifth century. Anura Dipura in Sri Lanka, the largest brick structure in the world. Gilbahara in Bolanurua, exhibiting the best examples of ancient similes, sculpting the mist encapsulated Bora Bura and monsoon light in Thailand. So this monumental field work trip which was slightly truncated by COVID. Um, and uh, so we move forward in any way to create three exhibitions so far. Um, there's one in Taiwan, it's a permanent uh, exhibition uh, which is currently receiving 10,000 people a day, so it's a little blockbuster. Um, one in Hong Kong and also touring in China. And these are just shots from this particular one of these, where we're combining both real and the digital objects together in quite powerful combinations. 360 degree 3D, as you've seen before, linear navigators for spatially revealing sites along a spatial map. Um, 360 degree videos, this is in Limbo of China. Um, and more uh, easy going installations, these are spherical gigapixel images. This is from a um, gallery where we embed a QR code, and then the visitor, of course, is inside that spherical image on a tablet or indeed on their phone. So many of these. Um, Buddhas and Bodhisattva sculptures that we um, captured have never been seen outside their country of origin before. So these seminal digital twins are also new solutions for distributed and collective ownership in contexts where um, we need repatriation. And they have great potential secured in the blockchain by smart contracts and also the distributed digital ledger. All of these areas are kind of untouched, um, but have great um, benefit to the cultural heritage sector. Double Truth, which is a work created from this uh, body of uh, sculptures, is um, one in which participants rotate a human scale viewing platform and circumambulate, generating a dynamic temporal sequence that reveals each of the 15 sculptures one by one. And reversing the platform, meanwhile, reveals unexpected materialities. Icons melt, they fragment and fold in a series of computer graphic transformations and parametric visualizations. And their acoustic realm is also augmented through sonification. Um, with rare ethnographic archival recordings from each of these Southeast Asian countries. And two truths in Mahayana Buddhism are the truths of the mundane and the absolute. And we know from art history itself that sculpture has its double truth. It is both a noun and a verb. It is at once frontality and multiplicity. We're getting there. This is the final section. <laughs> uh, the archaeology of the body. Um, and it looks at the processes of intangible heritage and digital documentation, reproduction, and transmission in museological contexts. Intangible cultural expressions are enacted, socially transmitted, and intimately linked to people. And these practices are traditions and performances are defined by their reliance on tacit and embodied knowledge systems. And this really goes to the heart of computational museology with a kind of whole of environment encoding approach. The example that I'll show you comes from the Hong Kong Martial Arts Living Archive project, 
Um, Hong Kong is an extraordinary reservoir of intangible heritage, primarily of Hakka people. And from the early to the mid 20th century, Hong Kong provided refuge for teeming thousands of immigrants from mainland China. And amongst them were some of the most prominent martial artists in the world. But with globalization, urbanization, and dwindling numbers of practitioners, this living heritage made internationally so famous by Jackie Chan, Gordon Liu, and Hong Kong cinema, now in danger of becoming lost. So this is a 4D archive, I guess. It's based on extensive motion capture, host of green screen uh, technologies, um, high-speed video. We've done 130 sets of empty hands and weapon sequences, 19 styles, 33 practitioners, about 60% of the total repertoire. And so this is Oscar, both his father and his great-grandfather were Kung Fu masters. So you can see how fast and how precise um, these forms are. Once we have a motion data set, of course, we can uh, create a wireframe model. We can also annotate the left hand, right hand, left foot, right foot, and the dancing point is uh, motion over time analysis. We've had nine exhibitions worldwide. The Hong Kong government is just building a new museum for it and for the archive. Uh, and it's an ongoing research project, so it's been going since 2010 years now, and we continue to work on it. And I'll just show you, because we've produced so lot, uh, such a lot from this, I'll just show you various things. This is um, a rear projected six sided system that allows visitors to walk around and look inside at the masters from any point of view, a one to one scale. Um, this interactive in, uh, application reinterprets the motion uh, over time analysis as a small interface that allows you to change um, how you see this as a speed at any point on the body at any moment in time. Typical particle simulation. The theorist Brian Rotman uses the term corporeal gestural haptic writing, which recognizes motion capture as a continuous topological model that allows for the easier attainment of the effective qualities of movement. And instead of translating movement into symbols, as is done when speech is translated into writing, just for haptic writing is mediating technology that escapes purely signifying um, and operates well, in uh, interactive and participatory immersive regimes. In this post matching installation, for example, visitors are asked to reenact classic Kung Fu moves. The performance theorist Diana Taylor tells us that embodied and performed acts generate, record, and transmit knowledge. And these processes of documentation create a synthetic link or prosthesis to this embodied knowledge transmission. And it has been suggested that the way for us to read mocap and traces is to perform, perform or reenact the gesture on display. This is a curious um, project of this. Uh, this is Lam Sai Wing from uh, the 1920s. He was the first Kung Fu master um, to introduce photography into studio practice. So we have a bunch of photos of him. We also have no video, but we also have hand um, drawings um, from which these animated gifs were created. Uh, and so, so we asked his great-great-grandnephew, Oscar, to perform uh, iron wire boxing. And using the photographs, we created a 3D model of him, and then we combined these two data sets together. They stand life-size in the galleries. It's a chi building exercise. It's quite a curious archival object. And so even after 10 years, I have a PhD who's um, still working with these masters. She's currently 
working a lot on retrieval algorithms for different motion-based systems uh, and also um, motion ontologies. And the final section is this exhibition, Deep Face, which in a way brings together many of the ideas and applications that were touched upon. Um, and it was an exhibition to, to pose crucial questions about the potency of digital replicas to absorb audiences and enduring emotional encounters with universal art treasures. Um, this is EPFL Pavilions and Profile for Art and Science and Society. And the exhibition, and this is on the campus, it's the, um, the exhibition space I direct. Uh, and the exhibition takes up uh, two of these pavilions, so it's about a thousand square meters space. And I'll just show you slides, uh, photographs, um, and I'll read you the curatorial text. So the exhibition took the provocative title Deepfakes, yet it opposes the popular usage of deepfakes for manipulation and misinformation to explore very different perspectives, imagining objects through advanced computational techniques. Decades of computer science and engineering have revolutionized the tenets of verisimilitude and representation. Today's perfect pixels coalesce in imaging techniques designed to replicate cultural artifacts with ultimate fidelity. Simultaneously, as algorithms and computer vision reperform and reprocess the digitally visible, they're exposing the optical unconscious of art, calling us to re examine once again the object of itself. Remediated through participatory interfaces such as mixed, augmented, and virtual realities, Deepfake's art in its double creates new performative platforms for the complex archetypes that emerge out of computational practices as they intersect with art heritage. Through 21 installations, the exhibition is equally focused on affirming and activating visitors' sensory experiences, while also grappling with the critical implications of digital materialities that objects possess in post-original form. Cultural deepfakes have manifold significance. They're technologically empowered to offer forensic insights into invisible dimensions, generating unforeseen hypotheses and connections. These art science phenomena also propagate powerful auras which rise to the surface entangled with the effective qualities of the originating sources. Such augmented replicas are able to draw us into unparalleled tactility with the textures, patinas, and geometries of their counterparts. With its propensity for peripheral vision, machine learning has amplified the possible futures for curatorial and artistic practices, antagonizing outdated notions of authority, authenticity, and access. These practices are generating perpetually new archival entities, concurrently formed and formless. Digital facsimiles also decolonize matter as they defy hegemonic narratives, helping to liberate things from their colonial entrapments, confronting authoritative discourse, historical segmentation, and contesting social relations. In cases of heritage at risk due to warfare, iconoclasm, and climatic catastrophe, digital copies have enabled communities to become more resilient to loss. They can also provide reservoirs of cultural memory and instruments for those on the margins to speak back to their oppressors. Vital issues for cultural deep fakes, however, include how the encryption of digital counterparts in place of originals is exploding systems and codes of ownership, custodianship, and repatriation. While the accumulation and exploitation of digital patrimonial and cultural capital by technological elites unnervingly reenacts colonial constructs. Synchronously new forms of cryptographic control, such as non-fungible tokens, are being enabled for the network circulation of art promoting the blockchain as a potential dominion of arbitrary value is the hallmark of the intensification of late capitalism's newest investment 
for its enmeshed cultural objects rather than their deep population in the commons. Deepfake's art and its double is a cumulative narrative that embarks on these cross-cutting themes, traversing the simulacra of mirror walls, digital twins, cryptocurrency, and machine intelligence, while engaging the issues of nemesis, reenactment, memory, and decolonization. The exhibition's installations cycle us through some of the antithesis around which the history of art has been circumscribed. As postmodernism recedes, taking with it the assumed meaning of things, cultural deep fakes have become a central pivot for this dialectic. Recognizing the importance of cultural deep fakes opens the way to redefine the dominant cultural, technocultural logic of our contemporary era. And in 21 installations, the exhibition represents seminal objects of Pan-Asian art and architecture from China, Cambodia, India, Malaysia, Japan, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. The Middle East and North Africa are represented by important sites in Egypt, Syria, and Sudan, the United States of America, and significant European heritage sites in Armenia, Germany, and Italy, complete an almost encyclopedic offering made tangible through state-of-the-art imaging and interfaces that support interactive immersion. And I'm pleased to say it was extended uh, and uh, is now on a tour around the world uh, as, a, as a group show. And uh, during this show, I also ran an evaluation and I've got 29 survey questions that were answered by over a thousand visitors, so an incredibly powerful data set to analyze, and this will become part of an upcoming book called Deepfakes, a Critical Lexicon of Digital Museology, to be published by Rutledge in 2021.